What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we are going to be talking about a monster of a lecture. We're going to be talking about arrhythmias, and there's going to be a lot of stuff to go over. So let's get right into it, guys. So first things first, we're going to talk about two different types of arrhythmias. One is when you're going just too slow. This is called your Brady arrhythmias. And then we'll talk about another one you're going way too fast. And this is often referred to as your tacky arrhythmias. So when we talk about Brady arrhythmias, I think one of the biggest things to be able to remember here is that we're going to talk about this in two different blocks. One is we're going to talk about sinus bradycardia, and the other one is we're going to talk about AV blocks. But we'll get into the different types of AV blocks more when we get into the diagnostic section. So first things first, sinus bradycardia versus AV blocks, how do they differ pathophysiologically? When we talk about sinus bradycardia, this one is usually due to a dysfunction of the SA node. So the SA node is just not sending the action potentials appropriately at a good enough rate from the SA node through the atria to the AV node. So therefore the AV node is not receiving the electrical activity appropriately and it's not conducting that down into the ventricles to generate an appropriate ventricular rate. So therefore it's decreased conduction, decreased conduction, and therefore the ventricular rate will be low, usually less than 50. Now, oftentimes bradycardia, most textbooks will say it's usually less than 60. I personally like to go to like less than 50 beats per minute for truly concerning bradycardia. All right. I think the thing to remember though is like what is driving the sinus node dysfunction, the SA node dysfunction? There's a bunch of different things. So one of them I really would want you guys to think about is uh, nodal blockers. The common one is beta blockers, especially if it's like a beta blocker overdose. So when patients are taking maybe too much metoprolol, carvedilol, labetalol, these have the capability of blocking the beta-1 receptors. In other words, norepinephrine, epinephrine can't bind to these receptors. Therefore, they can't cause calcium influx. Therefore, this cell does not actually depolarize and send action potentials. That's what leads to the SA node dysfunction. The big thing to remember with beta blocker overdose is that usually it can be reversed by giving the patient the antidote such as glucagon. What's another one? Calcium channel blockers are another drug. This is usually verapamil, diltiazem. This is commonly given in patients who like have atrial fibrillation or some type of underlying tachyarrhythmia. If you give them too much of them, they block the calcium channels. Calcium can't run in. If calcium can't go in, they can't depolarize. They can't conduct electrical activity from the SA node downwards. That leads to the actual bradycardia. Now, the antidote that would lead to the reversal of the bradycardia would be calcium. And so it's important to remember that. The next one's digoxin. Digoxin is often given to patients who have atrial fibrillation. Um, it can also be given to patients who have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, less than 35%. This one's weird. It has two functions. One is it has a, a negative chronotropic action and a positive inotropic action. And we'll talk about that one a little bit in the tachyarrhythmias. But with nodal blockade, how this one works is it increases the acetylcholine in the synapses and has them activate the muscarinic 2 receptors. When you activate muscarinic 2 receptors, that causes a potassium ion efflux that hyperpolarizes the cell, makes it negative. Therefore, it will not conduct electrical activity and lead to a decreased heart rate. Oftentimes with digoxin toxicity, the big thing to remember is giving these patients digibind will often lead to the reversal of their bradycardia. Another one that I personally like to consider as a nodal blockade is hyperkalemia, especially when the potassium starts reaching six or seven. I see a couple things. One is I see peak T waves. I also may see a prolonged PR interval, and that's where you might start seeing the bradycardia. But I also kind of see like wide QRSs. They can go into a sine wave pattern and even break down into like VFib. PA arrest is very common as well. The concept behind this is that they inactivate the sodium channels. It's actually very interesting. So if you can't bring sodium into the cell, you can't depolarize it. You can't send action potentials from the SA node. And this is also problematic for the AV node, but we'll get into that. How does it do this though? It does it by actually increasing the resting membrane potential. Now watch this. Here we have a normal graph, right? So here's gonna be this part, here's gonna be this part. So time and voltage. So here's our normal resting membrane potential. Whenever the potassium's too high outside the cell, potassium inside the cell can't leave. So it stays in the cell. And therefore the resting membrane potential starts rising. There's the new one. Now you would think, okay, I start from a resting membrane potential, I depolarize, then I repolarize, and I would go back down to this point here. At this black dotted line, that's where the sodium channels go from the inactive state into the resting state and ready to be reactivated again. But if you have a new resting membrane potential via the blue line, they'll never make it to the state where they can actually become reactivated again. They can be ready to be activated again. So they'll never reach this point, so they'll always stay inactive. And that's what leads to this process. One of the big things is if you start seeing peak T waves, prolonged PR interval, um, maybe a wide QRS complex, sine wave pattern, give them calcium. It stabilizes the cardiac membranes. And that's the big thing to remember for this one. Now, these are common things that you can actually elucidate a lot from just their medication history or even talk to them about potential diseases they have and do they take any medications for their underlying diseases.
Another big thing is high vagal tone. So when a patient has a neurological catastrophes, subarachnoid hemorrhage, ICH, maybe they have like some type of traumatic brain injury and their intracranial pressure shoots up. What it may do is it may trigger a reflex activity of their vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, when it actually acts on the heart, it releases acetylcholine. This should sound familiar. Acetylcholine acts on the muscarinic 2 receptors, just like digoxin. That causes a potassium ion efflux, hyperpolarizes the cell, can't conduct electrical activity. And therefore, if it can't, it can't send the action potentials from the ST node fast enough. You got to then think, does the patient have any neuro neurological deficits in combination with the Cushing's triad, which is bradycardia, hypertension, and irregular breathing. Another one is decreased sympathetic tone. This is usually in the form of a severe form of hypothyroidism, often known as myxedema coma. In hypothyroidism, the beta-1 receptors are less sensitive to norepinephrine and epinephrine. Therefore, whenever they bind, they don't exhibit the actual same effect. And what they're supposed to do is bind to the beta-1 receptors and cause calcium ion influx. If they're not sensitive to the norepinephrine and epinephrine, they won't cause calcium influx. They won't depolarize and they won't send action potentials. All of these things that we just talked about is the driving factor of sinus bradycardia. What about the next concept here? And patients who have hypothyroidism, one quick fact before we move on, is that oftentimes if it's mixed edema coma, they'll have hypothermia. Their temperature will be very, very low. They may even have features of like in integumentary dysfunction. So mixed edema, usually on the pretibial region and sometimes even on the periorbital region. The last thing is just check their thyroid function test. That also may be indicative, especially if the T3, T4 level is low, and you can check their TSH to see if it's you know primary or secondary. All right, we move into AV block. So here's the interesting thing with AV node block. The problem with this one is that the SA node is firing, but the AV node is not receiving it and conducting the electrical activity down into the ventricles. That's, that's the problem here. So if the AV node is not conducting the electrical activity, that's what's going to lead to the ventricular rate being low where the heart rate's less than 50. Here's the concept, which is very nice and saves us a lot of time. What causes the AV node dysfunction? Everything we just talked about for the SA node dysfunction. So think about beta blocker overdose, calcium channel blocker overdose, digoxin overdose, hyperkalemia, uh, low sympathetic tone like hypothyroidism, especially mixed edema coma, and neurologic catastrophes like Cushing syndrome. All right, or, or, or Cushing's triad, I apologize. All right, the last thing to think about for AV node block, besides what we thought, talked about for SA node dysfunction, for sinus bradycardia, is nodal destruction. So if you destroy the AV node, that thing ain't gonna work, it's not gonna conduct electrolyte activity. So what are some reasons for this one? Another one would be an inferior MI. So you know where you occlude the right coronary artery that's supposed to plus supply the right ventricle? And so for these patients, if you knock out their uh, right coronary artery, they'll have an infarction of their right ventricle, but also their AV node. If you infarct their AV node, that thing's not going to work. It's not going to be able to send action potentials, and that's going to lead to this problem here. It's not going to be able to conduct the electrical activity if it's destroyed. Another one would be Lyme's disease. You know, Lyme carditis, whenever you have a really bad infection here, um, where they produce a bullseye rash, right? This one can also infect the AV node, and it could potentially lead to a third degree AV block. And the last one would be old age. This is usually due to senile fibrosis. So senile cardiac fibrosis of the AV node is very, very common. How do I differentiate these? An inferior MI, they're going to have angina, right? They're probably going to have some troponin elevations and get an EKG. Look for STS elevation and 2-3 AVF. And limes, look for that bullseye rash in combination with the third degree AV block. Oftentimes, they'll respond to what? Ceftriaxone. Usually limes you treat with doxycycline. But if they have limes carditis, you give them ceftriaxone. All right, that's our bradyarrhythmias. Not too bad, right? All right, my friends, now we're going to move on to the pathophysiology of tachyarrhythmias. Now, there's many different types of these. Let's talk about the supraventricular ones. So what are they? Sinus tachycardia, multifocal atrial tachycardia, proxismal supraventricular tachycardia. Oftentimes, you may just heard this as SVT. Another one would be atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. These are your supraventricular tachyarrhythmias, meaning that they originate usually above the AV node. All right, so there's going to be some type of process that's involving the atria, where these arrhythm arrhythmias are originating. If they originate from the ventricles, then it's referred to as ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation or torsades to points. Now, regardless of which type of arrhythmia this is, tachyarrhythmia, it's important to remember what's driving these. And there's three pathophysiological concepts that are responsible for this. One is enhanced automaticity. Now, what this generally means is this can be thought of in two ways. One is it's enhanced normal automaticity, which means that your SA node is firing to your AV node, to your um, bundle of His, to your bundle branches, to your Purkinje system way faster than normal. Or it's enhanced abnormal automaticity. You have an area in the atria that besides the SA node that's firing, sending information to the AV node, to the bundle of His, to the bundle branches, and it's moving very fast. 
You just have to ask yourself the question is what's causing this increased activity through the conduction system? And usually it's increased sympathetic tone. How does this do it? Well, increased sympathetic tone means that you're gonna stimulate the beta one receptors pretty heavily in the myocardium. The reason why this is important is because the sympathetic nervous system is usually when it's increased in activity, it's causing a lot of norepinephrine, epinephrine release. This hits the beta-1 receptors. This causes calcium influx. That depolarizes the cell. That causes increased conduction through this system. And that's where the increase in heart rate comes from. Because if I have increased SA node conduction or increased conduction through the AV node, my ventricular rates are going to be super high, greater than at least 100 beats per minute. That's the concept with increased automaticity. So what we'll do is later we'll talk about what are the things that increase sympathetic tone. All right. Another thing that can drive arrhythmias is what's called a re-entrant circuits. So this can occur in the atria. So here you see the circus movement around this particular area within the atria. As it moves through this kind of like area in this circus pattern, as it does that, it sends off these little electrical activities that kind of move down through the AV node, bundle of his bundle branches. And this can lead to some pretty nasty high rates, right? The concept here is what's causing the circus movement. Usually it's atrial remodeling that causes heterogeneity. So changes in the actual tissue makeup. And usually the atrial remodeling is due to a lot of pressure or volume inside of the atria that's stretching out the atria that causes this heterogeneity. So then you have to ask yourself the question, what's causing the stretching? And that's usually CHF, right? That's a definite one. Another one would be hypertension or mitral stenosis, right? The valvular heart disease. Another concept, what if it's in the ventricle? What if there's this area where there's a lot of circus movement moving around here and it's sending off a lot of these electrical activities here? All right, this would be the same thing. All right, well, this is usually due to ventricular remodeling. And usually that's a fibrotic scar due to ventricular fibrosis. What can cause a scar? A myocardial infarction. What could cause stretching? CHF, usually systolic heart failure. So in other words, you have to have CHF with a reduced ejection fraction, less than 35%. That's pretty bad. Or you have to have a very bad myocardial infarction that occurred there. These are drivers of re-entrant circuits because they create heterogeneity within the myocardial tissue and create this circus movement. And as you create this circus movement, you send off these electrical signals every time you run through that. And that's dangerous. All right. The next concept here is going to be triggered activity. Now, with increased triggered activity, what is this concept? How does this work? Well, let's say here you, again, you're normally supposed to have movement going from the SA node to the AV node to the bundle of his and to the bundle branches. What if I have an area besides the SA node that's firing at a very, very fast rate and it's kind of driving this activity down? This is called ectopy, right? So there's an ectopic focus and it's in the atria. This, whenever it fires, if it fires at a fast enough rate, it can cause tachycardia. The other one was what if it occurs in the ventricle? Well, then this is a ventricular ectopic focus, and this can definitely fire at very fast rates as well. So you can see tachycardia with this. The question is, is what's causing this little ectopic area to start firing undesirably? Well, usually it's due to depolarizations that come, you know, before the, the actual hearts had the complete time to repolarize and rest. And we call these after depolarization. So there's two types. One is early after. So in other words, you have here the upsloping. So this is the depolarization phase. Then you got the plateau phase and you're starting to go into the repolarization phase. What happens is before this thing can completely repolarize, you just stimulate it and cause it to start firing. So what would do that? A lot of different things. But again, it has to occur early. Usually this is due to something that kind of prolongs depolarization, like prolongation of the QT interval. This is, there's a couple different things, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, a bunch of different drugs. We'll go over that though. But this is the big thing here. That's the primary reason for EADs, early after depolarization. The other one's DAD, so it's delayed after. So again, here's your depolarization, here's your plateau phase, here's your repolarization. It's gonna occur later, so it's delayed. So as it's getting ready to repolarize, boom, you stimulate it and it starts firing. This is usually gonna be due to a lot of calcium influx into the cells. And that's the primary driver for the DADs, the delayed after depolarization. This is a lot of sympathetic problems, myocardial infarctions, digoxin toxicity, which again, we'll talk about a little bit later. But these are the three mechanisms, my friends, three mechanisms that drive oftentimes different tachyarrhythmias. So now what we gotta do is we gotta go through each type of tachyarrhythmia and talk about what are, which maybe which one of those pathophysiological processes occur and what drives that pathophysiological process. All right, here we go. Sinus tachycardia is primarily driven by increased automaticity, so increased sympathetic tone. So then you have to ask yourself the question, why is the SA node firing faster? Okay, the sympathetic activity is high. Why is the sympathetic activity high? Is the blood pressure low? Why would that be a cause? You know when your blood pressure drops, right? It activates the baroreceptors in your carotids and your aorta, tells your actual brainstem, especially the cardiac accelerator center, hey, send a lot of sympathetic outflow. 
That sympathetic alpha flow leads to a lot of norepinephrine, epinephrine release, especially onto the myocardium. Hits the beta-1 receptors and shuttles a lot of calcium and sodium into these cells, which depolarizes them and increases the conduction from the SA node to the AV node downwards, increasing the heart rate. So you have to think about, is the patient's blood pressure low? And if it is low, think about causes. Are they in cardiogenic shock? Are they in obstructive shock? Are they in septic shock, hypovolemic shock? Work them up for that. Increase their blood pressure and their tachycardia should improve. Are they hypoxemic? Is their PaO2 less than 60 millimeters of mercury? Do they have a low O2 saturation? If they are, it could be activating the chemoreceptors, the peripheral chemoreceptors, and the carotids in the aorta. Activating the sympathetic nervous system, trying to increase your uh, heart rate, to increase your cardiac output. Why? Because if you increase your cardiac output, that'll increase your blood pressure. If you increase your cardiac output, you push more blood to the lungs, which will help with gas exchange to improve your VQ matching. That's the concept here. But think about causes. Oftentimes, you know what the most common cause is? Pulmonary embolism, maybe even pneumonia, or severe COPD exacerbation. Another one that's actually really weird because it can be it can cause like an anemic type of hypoxemia is severe anemia. So think about that one as well. Hyperthyroidism is interesting because what happens is, especially if a patient has what's called thyroid storm, and thyroid storm, remember hypothyroidism decreased the sensitivity of the beta-1 receptors? Hyperthyroidism increased the sensitivity of them. So now you have a lot of calcium influx, sodium influx, a lot of depolarization. You know what else hyperthyroidism does? It also increases your metabolic rate. If you increase metabolic rate of cells, they're going to fire and move a little bit more, like faster. You know what else increases your metabolic rate? Fevers, which can be due to a lot of different things, especially hyperthyroidism. And when you increase metabolic rate, that naturally directly can increase the activity of these myocardial cells and cause them to fire faster. It's important to remember for hyperthyroidism, think about them having an increased body temperature in combination with evidence of hyperthyroid levels. And I think it's important to remember that you can actually treat these patients with propanolol. And that oftentimes may improve their underlying tachycardia. With fever, you just treat their underlying cause of the fever or give them Tylenol, cool them, and oftentimes that will improve their underlying tachycardia. Other reasons why patients can be tachycardic is what? could be sympathomimetic drugs. So drugs that act like norepinephrine, epinephrine, so they exhibit the same beta-1 stimulation. Think about a patient who has uh, maybe asthma, COPD exacerbation, they're getting tons and tons of albuterol. That could cause this. Or they're hypotensive and they're on norepinephrine, epinephrine. Those stimulate the beta-1 receptors and can increase your blood pressure and your heart rate. On top of that, cocaine, methamphetamine, if these patients are exhibiting types of activities that can, are concerning for drug use, check a tox screen to see if those are coming back positive. And lastly, if a patient has like palpitations, headaches, diaphoresis, hyperglycemia, hypertension, tachycardia that are intermittent, work them up for chromocytoma if you have a high degree of suspicion by checking some urine and serum metanephrines. These are the most common reasons why patients can develop sinus tachycardia. Besides, I wouldn't forget pain and anxiety. Pain and anxiety can also lead to very common increased sympathetic tone. All right, that's the big thing to remember for this one. Multifocal atrial tachycardia, yes, can also be due to increased automaticity, but the primary reason why this one develops is not all of these things that I talked about. It's one thing. It's oftentimes chronic hypoxemia. The big thing I want you to remember and write down, guys, is the COPD. In patients who have COPD or they use the drug that we use to treat COPD, like theophylline, this is oftentimes the most common cause of multifocal atrial tachycardia. Another one's called paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. This one's due to reentry. All right. Now you're like, oh, that's the, like the weird circus movement that occurs in different areas and causes the electroactivity that gets sent down into the ventricles or maybe it originates from the ventricles. Either way, I know that it's a circus movement. My question is, is why is this circus movement developing? Well, I know that it, if it was like the atrial, the ventricular ones, it was like stretching, right, of the atria, or remodeling of the atria, remodeling of the ventricles. What if it happens just because it was already there? What if it's anatomical? It has nothing that to do with any underlying disease processes or remodeling per se. This is when I want to talk about this guy. So there's two different types of PSVT, if you will. One's called AVNRT, so AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. So there's some type of reentrant circuit that's a kind of originating here in the AV node. So if you zoom in on it, imagine here's kind of an electrical conduit coming from the atria to the AV node here. And what happens is there's like this little fibrosis that occurs here in these patients, and it creates these two pathways. One will depolarize very, very slowly, and the other one will depolarize super fast. And because of that, it creates this heterogeneity, which leads to this weird circus movement. 
And so what happens is electrical activities will then kind of create this movement, which causes every single time it goes through this cycle to spit off electrical activity down to the ventricles super fast. The concept behind why this happens, why you'll have this circus movement is because the heterogeneity causes a slow pathway. So this pathway can you know, usually depolarize very slowly, but repolarize very quickly. And then this pathway depolarizes really, really fast, but then repolarizes really quickly. So it creates the perfect opportunity for a circuit to continue to move through this in the most perfect manner. And it can create very, very dangerously quick arrhythmias or tachycardia. I think one big thing to remember for this one is oftentimes you won't be able to really see a P wave. Sometimes the, the actual P waves may be there, but they're oftentimes maybe like retrograde P waves that I would be potentially looking for. Another anatomical one is called Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome. It's an AV reentrant uh, tachycardia. And it's usually due to this thing here called the bundle of Kent. It's like this like entryway between the atria and the ventricles. And so it allows action potentials to travel directly from the atria into the ventricles. Now, the danger of this is that this can bypass the AV node. So imagine if a patient had atrial fibrillation and they're beating at a rate of like 200, 250. If they go through the bundle of Kent because they bypass the AV node, then the atrial rate can equal the matricular rate. The patient can go into VFib easily. And so that's terrifying to remember. If the patient doesn't have a pre-excitation syndrome like AFib though, oftentimes the classic things that we look for in the ECG for Wolf Parkinson's White syndrome is the triad known as a decreased PR interval, a wide QRS complex, and a delta wave. And this is something that we'll talk about a little bit more in the ECG interpretation. All right, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. This one's interesting. So increased automaticity can drive this process. The problem is, is that usually it's not the primary thing that causes a patient to go into atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. It can be a trigger though. So for example, let's say that a patient's hypotensive or hypoxemic, hyperthyroid, or they're having fevers, or they're taking a sympathomimetic drug. That's gonna increase the automaticity. It's gonna cause these areas to wanna fire faster. But then combine that with a reentrant circuit, and that's where you start seeing patients who start developing some pretty nasty atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. So atrial flutter usually has this reentrant circuit called the cavotricuspid isthmus, and that's a really large reentrant circuit here. So if a patient has this, and then on top of that, they become hypotensive, hypoxemic, hyperthyroid, um, they take some sympathomimetics, or they have a really bad fever, this can put them into a very bad atrial flutter. Same concept, if a patient has atrial fibrillation, they usually have these like reentrant circuits that occur in multiple areas, but usually right around the entry of the pulmonary veins. So if you have these, and then on top of that, the patient becomes hypotensive, hypoxemic, hyperthyroid, febrile, takes a sympathomimetic drug, boom, you can pop them into atrial fibrillation. Here's another concept. If a patient has those reentrant circuits, they have high sympathetic tone. And then on top of that, you add in some triggered activity, some increased early after depolarizations. And you cause these ectopic foci to fire more abnormally. What could drip try to drive this? Hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, all of these things can prolong the QT interval, prolong depolarization, and push them to have these EADs, the triggered activity. So what I really want you to remember is atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation is a combination of all of these. It's usually a patient has a reentrant circuit. So they have, for example, atrial fibrillation, they have those reentrant circuits due to atrial remodeling. So they had underlying hypertension, they have CHF, they have mitral valve uh, stenosis. That's causing the reentrant circuits by increasing the left atrial pressure and atrial remodeling. That's their chronic problem. Then you add a sympathetic tone. You make them hypotensive. You make them hypoxemic. You give them hyperthyroidism. You give them a drug. Or you give them a fever. Or you make them hypokalemic, hypomagnesemic. That's enough to drive them into that disease process. That's the thing I want you to remember. Now, with that being said, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, same concept. It's usually not just this that puts them into ventricular tachycardia. It's a combination of things. So for example, if a patient goes into VTAC or VFib, they may have one of these potential factors going on in combination to having a reentrant circuit. So in other words, they have to have some ventricular remodeling that must be going on. Remember here that this could be due to, in ventricular, the circus movements due to a fibrosis, so maybe they had a myocardial infarction, right? Or maybe they have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, less than 35%, and that's causing this area here to become super act agitated and create reentrant circuits due to the heterogeneity in the pathways. Again, I think one quick thing to remember here 
is that there's two different types of ventricular tachycardia. One is if you only have one of these guys here, it's called monomorphic. All the QRS complexes look the exact same. Or you could have like maybe more than one, so two or three of these potential areas, then it's gonna cause all the QRS complexes to look a little bit different because they're coming from different areas in the ventricles. And that's called polymorphic. But either way, in ventricular tachycardia, you need a reentrant circuit, usually in combination with increased sympathetic tone. Another one of these is ventricular fibrillation. You need to have these particular areas, multiple areas of reentrant circuits, in combination with having a patient have increased sympathetic tone. So usually a patient has an MI, they have heart failure, and then on top of that, you make them hypotensive, hypoxemic, you have them hyperthyroid, febrile, sympathomimetic drug, boom, puts them into VTAC or VFib. What makes it even worse is that triggered activity can also propagate this process. Again, it's multiple things. So are they hypokalemic, hypomagnesemic? That can also cause them to develop VTAC and VFib, especially in combination with a reentrant circuit and increased sympathetic tone. Now, with triggered activity, there is EADs, but there was another one. What was the other one? DADs. So with DADs, this is usually due to increased sympathetic tone that can massively increase calcium influx by increasing the beta-1 receptor activity. You know what else? Myocardial infarction. This is a really big one. So myocardial infarction can cause both triggered activity and reentry. The concept behind myocardial infarction is usually the patient will present with angina, they'll present with an elevated troponin, they'll present with ST changes. And then on top of that, you know what's really important for this one? When you infarct a tissue cell, you lose the entire like cell integrity. So it's not as you know, semi-permeable as it used to be. So calcium can just easily influx into these cells. And that's one of the problems here is why they get a lot of calcium influx. Because DADs is calcium influx, EADs is prolonged QT. What's another thing that can actually cause calcium influx? Digoxin toxicity. It's really weird because usually this one, will, it'll respond to digibind, but the concept here is that with digoxin toxicity inhibits the sodium potassium ATPases in these myocardial cells. And if you do that, you prevent sodium, kind of the, you inhibit the actual sodium exchange. And so the sodium inside of the cells is much lower. The problem with that is that now I can't properly exchange the calcium. And so calcium kind of builds up inside of these cells. And as a result, calcium levels really high in the cells, depolarizes the cells and causes them to develop triggered activity. So the big thing that I need you to remember here, my friends, is that ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, they all often depend on a combination of all three of these things to put a patient into these deadly arrhythmias. The last kind of tachyarrhythmia is torsada points. This one's really only dependent upon triggered activity. And so usually this patient has some type of hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia that's prolonging their QT interval. But then what you do is you throw in some drugs that also prolong the QT interval even more. And what happens is it's so severe that this can actually cause a patient to go into torsades. So have hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia plus QT prolonging medication, recipe for disaster. So what are some of these drugs? I like to remember the antiarrhythmics such as amiodarone, abutilide is a common one, antibiotics like macrolides, antipsychotics, which helps with the mnemonic here, uh, such as haloperidol, Another one would be antidepressants, SSRIs, TCAs, and antiemetics like ondansetron or compazine. Either way, if you have any of these medications in high doses in combination with hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, it's enough to prolong the QT interval, prolong the depolarization, and shoot them into this triggered activity, which can cause torsades to points. So I know that this is a lot to remember. I just want you guys to try to be able to understand that again, all of these arrhythmias are dependent sometimes on multiple different concepts. It's not just one pathophysiological process. That leads us to the next step. Patients who have arrhythmias, sometimes they can be completely like asymptomatic. It's more like an incidental finding. Sometimes it can be super terrifying. But what I really want you to remember here with arrhythmias is how do I, how do I identify an unstable arrhythmia versus a stable arrhythmia. So in patients with unstable arrhythmia, oftentimes there's the Brady and the tachy. The Brady's oftentimes, we'll talk about these, we haven't gotten to them yet, but second degree Mobitz 2 and third degree AV block are usually the most severe Brady arrhythmias. You can see you know, unst instability with sinus bradycardia, first degree, second degree Mobitz 1, but it's not gonna be as common. These are really, really bad. And these will directly drop your heart rate. And we'll talk a little bit about how that can cause instability in a second. With respect to tachyarrhythmias, there's a bunch of them, right? Atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, proximal superventricular tachycardia, 
ventricular tachycardia, all of these can kind of generate some pretty fast heart rates. And your heart rates can go up to greater than 150. Now, how do these cause instability per se? Well, let's start here with this one because this one's really easy. With an increased heart rate, your diastolic time frame is reduced significantly. You don't allow for the ventricles to be filled appropriately. If your ventricular filling is reduced, what happens to your preload? Your preload drops. If your preload drops, what happens to your stroke volume? That drops. If your stroke volume drops, what happens to your cardiac output? It drops. Before we go move on to the next step, what's the cardiac output equal to? Heart rate times stroke volume. If heart rate drops, that's going to do what? Drop the cardiac output. Here's the interesting concept. With severe bradycardia, it'll directly drop the cardiac output. With severe tachycardia, it indirectly drops the cardiac output by dropping the ventricular filling. Now, when cardiac output drops, that drops your blood pressure because blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times your systemic vascular resistance. So if blood pressure goes down, I'm not going to perfuse organs like the brain. And so they can syncopize. They can develop confusion. They can have declining level of consciousness, such as maybe lethargy. Maybe they can become super fatigued, obtunded. And this is very important to remember because this is what I refer to as an altered mental status. If they're not perfusing their myocardium, so they're not getting enough blood flow out of their left ventricle to fill their coronary arteries, are they going to give enough oxygen to their coronary uh, to their myocardium? No. If the myocardium becomes ischemic, what is the most common presentation of myocardial ischemia? Angina. So if a patient has altered mental status and angina, that's an indication of instability, regardless if they're super bradycardic or tachycardic. If their cardiac output from their left ventricle is low enough that they're not getting blood out of their left ventricle into the aorta, it can backflow into the pulmonary veins, into the actual alveoli and cause pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema oftentimes presents with severe dyspnea and sometimes hypoxia. If that happens, that's an indication of acute heart failure. And again, that is an indication of instability in the context of bradyarrhythmia or tachyarrhythmias. The last one is, is the patient's blood pressure enough that it's really, really low, way below our normal limits? So there's, a, there's two different definitions here. There's hypotension and then there's shock. Hypotension we often define as a couple different ways. So solid blood pressure less than 90. A diastolic blood pressure less than 60, but I prefer the next one here, which is a MAP, a mean arterial pressure less than 65, because that's our perfusion pressure. If these are low, then the patient is considered to be hypotensive, and that's enough. So if a patient's tachycardic, bradycardic, and hypotensive, that's enough to consider them to be unstable. Take it a step further. They're hypotensive, and you have to add on drugs to push their blood pressure up such as inotropes to make their heart squeeze more or vasopressors to squeeze their blood vessels because if you squeeze blood squeeze the blood vessels your resistance goes up and if resi what is blood pressure equal to cardiac output times resistance so if resistance goes up blood pressure goes up if you're using these drugs to try to maintain a good blood pressure you're in shock <laughs> And that's a concerning finding. Another thing that concerns me of shock is if they're hypotensive on these medications plus their lactate's elevated because it means I'm not perfusing my organs appropriately. And then even worse than that, if I have a high lactate, hypotension requiring pressors, and I'm having to compensate and squeeze my vessels and vasoconstrictum that my extremities are becoming cold, pale, mottled, that means my resistance is way too high and I'm in a shock state. If I have hypotension, if I have altered mental status, angina, hypoxia, or dyspnea, or worst case scenario, full-blown cardiogenic shock, that's an indicator of instability in that setting of an arrhythmia. Okay, <clears throat> the next complication, the most terrifying is cardiac arrest. And this can be seen in four different types, but we'll go through this in the sense that the patient has an abnormal electrical activity, they're not generating an, a good enough cardiac output. And actually, I would say they're not generating a cardiac output at all. Therefore, if they're not getting blood out of their heart into their actual circulation, they're not generating a blood pressure. If you're not generating a blood pressure, if I go to feel their radial pulse, I won't feel one. So they don't have a pulse. Therefore, they're not perfusing organs. If they're not perfusing organs, we are now considering this patient to be in cardiac arrest. The type of cardiac arrest that they are in depends upon the type of rhythm that they're in. So are they in PA arrest, meaning that they have an organized rhythm on their ECG. So it looks like normal sinus, but they don't have a pulse. That's PEA. Do they have a flat line and then no pulse? That's asystole. These are non-shockable rhythms. In other words, you don't defibrillate these patients. You just do compressions and give them epi. In the other scenario, do they have VTAC? Do they have a wide 
and um, uh, now wide type of regular tachycardia. That's concerning for ventricular tachycardia. And that right there is a shockable rhythm. And then lastly, do they have this wide irregular rhythm that's consistent with V-fib? That's also shockable rhythm. So these are shockable. This is not shockable. The question that you have to ask for these patients is what drove their cardiac arrest? Why did they go from having an arrhythmia to having pretty much no blood pressure, no pulse? And you want to remember these based upon the ease of them, especially during a code, which is the H's and T's. So as a patient is undergoing the CPR process, you want to be evaluating the underlying cause. Could it be due to hypoxia? Could it be due to hypotension that they're having this? Could it be due to severe acidosis? Could it be due to hypo or hyperkalemia that's causing this? Could it be due to hypothermia? Could it be due to tamponade, which is causing an obstructive shock? Tension pneumothorax causing an obstructive shock? Is it a thrombus, particularly within the myocardial kind of area, the coronary vessel, so an MI, causing cardiogenic shock? Is it a PE, causing obstructive shock and severe hypoxemia? Or is it toxins that are driving this process? The reason why it's important to know this is that if you kind of treat these, you may prevent them from either going back into cardiac arrest or take them out of cardiac arrest. Give them oxygen, increase their blood pressure, maybe give them volume, give them vasopressors, give them bicarb, give them potassium, give them calcium, and get rid of the excess potassium. Warm them up, do a pericardiosynthesis, do a chest tube, give them TPA, give them TPA, reverse the toxin if possible. That's the concept and why this is important. All right, my friends, now let's talk about the diagnostic approach to bradyarrhythmias. So for these patients, if they're coming in, they're bradycardic, heart rate less than 60, preferably ILIC less than 50, then you first need to do, uh, the first thing you need to do is obtain an ECG. The reason why this is going to tell you if it's a sinus bradycardia or an AV block, and then we're going to go through the different types of AV blocks. I, I'm excited to show you guys this. So first things first. When you look at the ECG, you have to ask three questions. Is there a sinus rhythm? In other words, if I look at this ECG here, is the P wave upright in lead two and inverted in AVR? If it is, that's kind of indicative of at least sinus rhythm. Next thing, if I look at these and I go after the rhythm strip and I look at every single component, after every P wave, is there a QRS complex? If there is, okay, it's still potentially sinus bradycardia. The last thing I have to have to make it sinus bradycardia is I have to have a normal PR interval, meaning that the distance from the beginning, from before, right before the def upward deflection to the point where I have my downward deflection for the Q wave of the QRS complex, I have to have this between 160 to 200 milliseconds, which is usually less than one big box. If that is the case, it's normal, then this patient has sinus bradycardia. If they don't meet these definitions, in other words, I drop a QRS complex somewhere, my PR intervals, abnormal, it's an AV block. And then I have to just decide what type of AV block I have. So how do I do that? Well, I like to look at these and kind of go through this. So the first one is, is the PR interval prolonged, meaning it's greater than one big box. So if I zoom in on it, is this greater than one big box? And it 100% is, it's greater than 200 milliseconds. So therefore, I have an AV block. I just have to ask myself the question. In order for it to be a first degree, you can't drop a QRS. It's just a prolonged PR interval. Do I drop any QRSs here? No, that's a first degree. Is my PR interval getting, when I zoom in here, longer and longer and longer, and then do I drop a QRS complex? Because if I do, that's a second degree Mobitz one. So it's longer, longer drop, you have a winky block, right? The next thing is if I zoom in here on my rhythm strip, is the PR interval constant, but then I just randomly drop a QRS complex here after that P wave. If that's the case, that's a second degree Mobitz too. And then lastly is if just like I look at this thing and there's like a ton of P waves and then there's a, you know, a bunch of QRS complexes that are usually maybe wide, meaning it's an infranodal block, or I just see a bunch of P waves and they're beating at their own rate and there's just really no relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes. This is complete atrial ventricular disassociation. This is 100% a third degree AV block. So now it takes me to the next one, which is diagnostic approach to tachyrhythmias. So now again, patients greater than 100 beats per minute. Next thing I have to ask myself is, okay, get an ECG. Look at the ECG and look to see what the actual QRS complexes look like. Do they look wide or narrow? If it's narrow, if I were to measure between this QRS complex, it has to be less than 120 milliseconds. That's three little boxes. If it is, then it's a narrow tachycardia. Then I ask myself the next question. What's the intervals? Is it regular or irregular? 
So then I have to look at the R to R interval. So if I look here and I measure the distance between each R to R interval, if they're the, exactly the same all the way down this rhythm strip here, that's a narrow regular tachycardia. And I have three differentials. One is sinus tachycardia, PSVT, and two to one atrial flutter. All right, well, let's go through each one of these. With sinus tachycardia, oftentimes if you zoom in on the lead two, it's upright and lead two, right? And it's inverted P wave in AVR. And then every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. That's sinus tachycardia. So again, upright and lead two, inverted AVR, every P wave followed by a QRS complex, and they're tachycardic, it's sinus tachycardia. If I look here and I see no P waves, then I'm saying, okay, this could be PSVT. Oftentimes it can be difficult if they're going super fast and I like to do a vagal maneuver or adenosine and it stretches them out a little bit more. But in this particular scenario for PSVT, you're looking either for no P waves or potentially some retrograde P waves, all right? The next one's atrial flutter. Atrial flutter, I like to look in two, three AVF sometimes even flip the ECG upside down. And you're looking for these like flutter waves, which is usually pretty common and indicative of two to one atrial flutter. Now, when I see these and I say, oh, it's sinus tachycardia, then I gotta go back and think, what was the causes? Oh, okay, well it was, you know, maybe low blood pressure, hypoxemia, maybe it was hyperthyroidism, maybe it was a fever, some pathomimetics. Treat those things and see if they get better. If it was PSVT, it's usually some type of like abnormal reentrant circuit that's usually due to an anatomical problem. Oftentimes, there's nothing that's usually driving this. It's just this abnormal anatomical process. And then for atrial flutter, it's usually a reentrant circuit, the caval tricuspidismus, in combination with triggered activity, hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, or increased sympathetic tone, hypotension, hypoxemia, hyperthyroidism, sympathomimetics, and, and then fevers. So again, treat those and see if the patient can get a little bit better. The next thing is if they have a, again, a narrow QRS and a abnormal R to R interval, meaning that when I measure these, they are not the same throughout, then this patient has a narrow irregular tachycardia. And this gives me pretty much two differentials, atrial fibrillation. I like to look in V1 really for atrial fibrillation. And what would help me is that I'd be able to see like these fibrillatory waves that would usually be indicative of atrial fibrillation. The other one is multifocal atrial tachycardia. I would kind of try to zoom in on the rhythm strip here and I would try to look for three morphologically different P waves. And if I can see that, that's super indicative of multifocal atrial tachycardia. Now, with that being said, atrial fibrillation is a reentrant circuits due near the palm, entry of the pulmonary veins plus hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, or increased sympathetic tone, hypotension, hypoxemia, hyperthyroidism, some type of sympathomimetic drugs, as well as maybe even fever. Treat those and see if it can fix the patient's underlying cause. Multifocal atrial tachycardia, usually COPD or theophylline use. Now, we go to the opposite side. So we go down the other arm. So now the QRS complex is greater than 120 milliseconds. That's why it's greater than three little boxes. And why tachycardia? Look at the RR interval. Is it normal? In other words, if I track all these out, is it going to be the same distance? If it is, there's really just, I prefer one differential, but there is technically two, according to some of the textbooks. You have ventricular tachycardia, which is going to be very evident here as the wide QRS complexes and again, a very similar morphology. So we call this monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. When I see wide regular tachycardia, for me, it's ventricular tachycardia until proven otherwise. Now, while that's being said, there is the possibility of PSVT. So what do I mean by this? So if I come back for a second here, PSVT is proxismal supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. What the heck does that mean? That means that they have PSVT, which is a narrow regular tachycardia, but then you throw in a bundle branch block and the bundle branch block is what makes it look wide and regular. But it's, it's important to be able to understand that it's not easy to differentiate these two. You can use like different types of criteria like the Brigado criteria, but it's relatively difficult. And oftentimes if you treat ventricular tachycardia and it was P PSVT, you'll be safe. But if you treat PSVT with aberrancy and it's really ventricular tachycardia, it could actually be dangerous. So it's important to remember that it's always VTAC until proven otherwise. Now take the other scenario where the actual RR interval is abnormal, it's not the same distance. Then I'm thinking about something like ventricular fibrillation. When I see this, this is ventricular fibrillation. It's wide, it's irregular, it's erratic. This is super scary when you see this one, all right? Another one will be torsades de point. So torsades de point is usually going to be seen with a patient who has a preceding prolonged QT interval. So the QT interval will be pretty long. 
And then all of a sudden, shoop, 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 you see kind of a polymorphic presentation of ventricular tachycardia. So prolonged QT followed by a polymorphic presentation of ventricular tachycardia is super suggestive of torsades. So for example, if I kind of zoom in on one of these areas here, you'll see that it has this constant like ribbon type of pre presence to it. And that's super classic of torsades to points, all right? The last one here is atrial fibrillation with aberrancy. Again, this is basically atrial fibrillation we know is a narrow irregular, but if you throw in a bundle branch block, it makes it wide and irregular. Again, I think it's important to remember for VTAC, VFib, torsades to points, think about the underlying cause. For VTAC, VFib, it's probably reentrant circuits from myocardial infarction or heart failure, plus increased sympathetic tone, as well as potentially electrolyte abnormalities, as well as digoxin toxicity in those situations. And then for torsades, it's usually just hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia in combination with prolonged uh, QT interval medications. All right, that's our, our kind of diagnostic algorithm. Now we go into how do we treat bradyarrhythmias. So we have a patient who comes in, their heart rate's less than 60. Again, I prefer less than 50. And I got to ask myself the question, what are the different types? Now, yes, there is sinus bradycardia, but there's also the blocks that I really want to notice. Is it a first degree? Is it a second degree Mobitz 1? Is it a second degree Mobitz 2? Is it a third degree AV block? I want to be able to identify this. But the most important thing is if their heart rate's less than 50 and they have features of instability, that is an unstable patient. That's unstable symptomatic bradycardia. What are features of instability? Come on, think about it. You're not perfusing the brain, altered mental status. You're not perfusing the myocardium, angina. You're having backflow into the lungs, hypoxemia, dyspnea. You're having a low blood pressure or you're having a low blood pressure that's why requiring vasopressors. You're in hypotension, you have hypotension or shock. In any of those scenarios, the patient needs to be given atropine. You give them atropine because it basically blocks the muscarinic two receptors and it helps to be able to allow for the patient to have a buildup in their heart rate. Problem is sometimes this will fail and it commonly fails in infranodal AV blocks when the QRS complex is wide. So if it fails, okay, next thing to do is give them epinephrine. If it works, great. You stop there. You don't move any farther down this algorithm here. And then you go look for the underlying cause. So you have to ask yourself, is it a beta blocker overdose, calcium channel blocker overdose, digoxin overdose, hyperkalemia, is it a ICP crisis? Is it potentially um, uh, uh, hypothyroidism, like myxedema coma? Uh, is it some type of myocardial infarction, like a right coronary artery occlusion? Is it Lyme carditis? And you do a full workup and treat the underlying cause. But if atropine doesn't work and you're the patient's still unstable, you don't go work up the underlying cause, you stabilize them. So what's the next thing? Epinephrine. Now, epinephrine is pretty good, and sometimes it will really work. If it does work, I like to start an epinephrine infusion. But even if it doesn't work, I still would consider starting an epinephrine infusion. And if you don't want to use that one, you can consider other types of infusions, such as isoproteranol and dopamine. So epinephrine will hit the beta-1 receptors pretty hard. It also has, again, some alpha receptor. Isoproteranol is a pure beta-1 receptor. So this is actually my favorite one. This can get the heart rate out of a stone. And dopamine is a pretty good one as well. It has a beta-1 receptor activity, but it also has some dopamine receptors. But these, any of these will do. Now, how do I use these? I start off with atropine. They still have, a, have um, bradycardia and instability. Start epinephrine, give them an epinephrine push. They're still bradycardic and they're showing signs of instability. Start them on an infusion. You can do epinephrine, you can do isoproteranol, you can do dopamine. You're trying to maintain at least somewhat of a stable heart rate. All right. You don't want them to decompensate and code. While you're doing that, you're getting the pads on the patient to pace them. So you start the infusion, gives you time for your team to get the pads onto the patient and start doing transcutaneous pacing. So you put the pads on the patient and it's going to send electrical activity and become the pacer of the heart. While you're doing this, you're going to give them pain medicine, you're going to give them uh, sedation, and you're going to put a catheter into their neck uh, or into their clavicle area and thread down this pacer wire into their heart where it will then act as a temporary pacemaker. It's called a transvenous pacer. And that's only going to be done in the interim until you can get the patient stable. And once they're stable, you'll put in a permanent pacemaker for the remainder of their life to prevent any bradycardia in the future. All right, what about the treatment of tachyarrhythmias? So in this type of patient, we will talk about the unstable form in a second. But for tachyarrhythmias, I want you to think about all the different types, at least the ones that we really should address. 
So for PSVT, proxismal supraventricular tachycardia, if they're going really fast, which they can, they can get heart rates up to 170s, 180s, 200s. <clears throat> it's important to remember, for these, the first thing that you should do is try to suppress the actual AV node by doing a vagal maneuver because it releases acetylcholine and tries to block those that conduction by hitting the muscarinic two receptors and hyperpolarizing them. So you do this by maybe having them bear down Valsava and see if that works. If it doesn't and they don't go back into their native rhythm, then you give them adenosine. Adenosine, six milligrams, usually will work. And if that doesn't, you can try 12 milligrams. And it basically will help to shut down the AV node and reset the heart. Usually that will work. In the situation where the patient it works and then they flip back into PSVT multiple times, then I would say that you should start this patient on a long-term beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. So for beta blocker, this would be things like metoprolol, carvedilol. For calcium channel blocker, it'd be things like diltiazem or rapamil. And hopefully it'll prevent the recurrent episodes of PSVT. And if it doesn't, then that's when you consult the patient for electrophysiology study and consider them getting a, what's called a radio frequency ablation where they burn the bundle of Kent or they burn the abnormal uh, uh, pathways in the AV node for these patients. What about atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation? All right, with atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation, again, it's important to remember for this one that you're always trying to treat the underlying cause. For this one, it's an abnormal pathway. The best thing that'll get rid of it is a radiofrequency ablation. For these, it could be a bunch of things. It could be a reentrant circuit that could be amendable to radiofrequency ablation, right? Definitely possible. But it's oftentimes other things, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, uh, high sympathetic tone, right? A lot of those concepts. And so you have to treat the underlying cause, but in the interim, stabilize them. So one of the first things that we should do is we should rate control them. This is oftentimes superior in these patients. So this could be beta blockers, maybe start them off with some metoprolol or some carvedilol. And if that's not working, you can add on a calcium channel blocker like diltiazem, verapamil. And then I have seen in some scenarios where if despite they're on all of these, you can add on digoxin. If despite all of this, the patient is still in atrial fibrillation, um, so they're not kind of like slowing down, or you want to get them out of atrial fibrillation into normal sinus or their native rhythm, that's when you can go to rhythm control. Um, oftentimes this would be things like amiodarone if they have heart failure or sotolol if they have something like coronary artery disease. I think the big thing to remember is if the patient is developing refractory atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter despite avid and you know consistent rate and rhythm control that's when i would you know refer the patient to an electrophysiologist and consider like a radio frequency ablation where they burn the uh, re-entrant circuits around the pulmonary veins or they re they burn the circuit around the cavo tricuspidismus and that may be an effective therapy we then go into treatment of ventricular tachycardia now you may be asking yourself the question zach you didn't talk about uh, sinus tachycardia again you treat the underlying cause you don't give them any medications you treat the underlying cause you, oh, what about multifocal atrial tachycardia? You treat the underlying cause. You treat their COPD. Right? You get rid of the theophylline. For the ones that we talked about, those actually have specific medical therapies. So now let's go into the ventricular arrhythmia, such as ventricular tachycardia. And a patient who has stable, no features of instability with ventricular tachycardia, oftentimes the best medications here, when you see them, is to initiate rhythm control. So I like to get them out of this immediately. Amiodarone is good for heart failure, and I like a lidocaine if I suspect an MI. Then if I want to prevent them from going back into ventricular tachycardia, so let's say I get them on amiodarone, they convert to their normal rhythm, I want to prevent them from going back into ventricular tachycardia, and that's where I prefer like a beta blocker. If a patient keeps flipping into VTAC or they go into VTAC and they lose their pulse and they develop, a, you know, they go into cardiac arrest, if I get them back, I want to refer the patient potentially to an electrophysiologist to consider, hey, should we potentially do like an AICD um, to prevent them if they go into this rhythm from going into cardiac arrest. And so they would implant this in to shock them whenever they go into VTAC. Same concept is torsades. Torsades, the underlying cause here is usually hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and prolong, pro, uh, QT prolonging medications. So discontinue those, give them potassium, but most importantly, give them magnesium. Four grams of IV magnesium the moment you see this. And then again, with torsades to points, usually the big thing is treating the underlying cause, but there is certain diseases where torsades to points can actually be more frequent, especially if the patient has underlying channelopathies like long, uh, long QT syndrome. And those scenarios, if they have recurrent torsades or you, they have a, you know, they go into sudden, they develop a, 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 a cardiac arrest, I would potentially refer that patient for um, electrophysiology to consider getting an AICD, especially at the long QT syndrome. Now, 
we went through all the different types of like stable-ish tachycardias. What if I have a patient who has a unstable tachycardia? So they have a heart rate greater than 100, they have features of instability, which is what? Altered mental status from poor brain perfusion, angina for poor, poor myocardial perfusion, poor pulmonary backflow, increased pulmonary backflow leading to pulmonary edema in the form of dyspnea, hypoxia, hypotension, and maybe even features of shock. If they have that, what do I do? Well, in these patients, I don't even waste time with medications. I get the pads on them. I'm gonna initiate electrical therapy. So the type of electrical therapy you do depends upon the type of arrhythmia they have or tachyarrhythmia. If it's atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, um, uh, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, or VTAC, these are ones that you can actually cause the AED to sync up with their R waves, and you can cardiovert them through that particular process. All right, so any of these, you see these insta unstable, you can actually cardiovert these patients. However, if I see torsades, this is not something that the AED will do a good job of tracking the R wave for. So I won't even try to sync with their actual rhythm. I will just defibrillate them at any point in that actual arrhythmia. All right. So that's how we would treat these different types of tacky arrhythmias. And again, remember, this is what we would do to stabilize it. But you also have to remember, you have to treat the underlying cause. Last but not least is the treatment of cardiac arrest. If a patient comes in, right? and they have PEA or asystole. So what does that mean? That means that in both of these, they have no pulse because they have no cardiac output, right? In this particular situation, PEA is they have an organized rhythm, maybe normal sinus, or they're flatline, but they have no pulse. When you come to a patient, no pulse, oh, they're in PEA or asystole, what is the first thing that you tell them to do? The most important thing is to initiate CPR. Compressions is going to be literally the most important thing because you are now acting as the heart. You are perfusing the organs. You are perfusing their brain. And in this particular scenario, how well the compressions are performed will determine the potential long-term complications that this patient may experience. So pushing down will squeeze blood out of the heart, and then a good time of relaxation will allow for them to fill and compress back down again. This is the thing that's maintaining organ perfusion. While you're doing this, other team members should be obtaining good access for medications like epinephrine and uh, potential things like amiodarone and et cetera. The other thing is I should have other team members putting the pads on the patient to assess the rhythm to see if they need to be shocked. Usually PEA or asystole, that is not a shockable rhythm, but if they went into VTAC or VFib, that is a shockable rhythm. So you need to have the pads to analyze that. After I do CPR for about two minutes, I'll have everybody come off of the patient. We'll take a second, we'll look for a pulse, assess for a pulse, and look at the rhythm. If a pulse is present, then you have achieved return of spontaneous circulation. The patient can now terminate from the code, no more compressions, assess to see if they can follow commands. In other words, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you look at me? Can you communicate with me? If they can, good. They don't really need to undergo targeted temperature management or therapeutic hypothermia. If they can't or they have any myoclonic seizure activity, they need to be cooled immediately. If during that rhythm and pulse check, they do not have a pulse, at that point, again, assess. Is it an organized rhythm? Do they have PEA or are they asystole? Okay, if they are, you do not shock that patient. You do not defibrillate. It's not a shockable rhythm. You just give them one milligram of epinephrine and you get back on the chest and start doing compressions. And at the same time, you and your team member should be thinking about the H's and the T's. Do they have hypoxia? Give them oxygen. Do they have hypotension? Give them fluid. Give them vasopressors. Do they have acidosis? Give them bicarb. Do they have hypokalemia? Give them potassium. Do they have hyperkalemia? Give them calcium. Give them insulin. Give them bicarb. Give them potentially um, some type of medication uh, such as albuterol to shift the potassium. Do they have hypothermia? Warm them. Give them warm fluids. Is it tamponade? Do a pericardiosynthesis. Is it attention to orthorex? Throw in a chest tube. Is it a MI? Give them TPA potentially, right? Is it a PE? Give them TPA. Is it toxins? Give them the antidote if you know or if it's possible to do that. And that may prevent them from going back into cardiac arrest or get them out of cardiac arrest. And that's important to remember. 
If you have another patient who you come to and in that code you have no pulse, you look at the actual monitor and you see a wide complex, a wide regular, it could be VTAC, right, without a pulse. Or if you see the wide irregular rhythm and you see VFib, this is something that you have to be able to differentiate and say, hey, team members, start CPR. Do good quality compressions, get IV and IO access, get the pads on the patient, let's get the monitor ready to assess to see if they can analyze it, if it's a shockable rhythm. After two minutes, you reassess them. If they have a pulse, ROSC is achieved, good. If they're following, no myoclonus, no targeted temperature management. If they are not following, if they have myoclonus, targeted temperature management. If they do not have a pulse and they, they are in VTAC or they are in VFib, that is a shock of a rhythm. You defibrillate them, give them a milligram of epinephrine, get back on the chest and start, start CPR. The next time you do a rhythm and pulse check, if they're still in VTAC or VFib, you shock them. And an alternative to give that you can flip back and forth with besides epinephrine is amiodarone because that may help to reset the electrical activity. Either way, after every single time you give them a med and defibrillate them, you get back on the chest and you continue the CPR thinking about what is the causes of this patient going into this deadly type of rhythm. My friends, this is arrhythmias. It was a monster. I really hope that it made sense. I really hope that you guys enjoyed it. I love you. I thank you. And as always, until next time. Mm -hmm.